songs indicate, um, singing about the cross, we're getting closer and closer to the cross in our study of the book of Luke. We come to the 23rd chapter once again this morning. This is a journey that began not just in Bethlehem 33 years prior, this is a journey that began in eternity past, where before the foundation of the world, the Son of God was crucified in the mind and the plan of God. The crucifixion is the plan of God. And we are moving closer and closer to that historical event, in time event, in Luke chapter 23. Let me read to you the verses I'm going to look at this morning. It's not exactly what it said in the bulletin, but start back at verse 13. And I want to read to verse 26 of Luke chapter 23 this morning. Beginning in verse 13, Pilate summoned the chief priest and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought this man, Jesus, to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, saying, Crucify, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent and with loud voices asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted, and to release the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. In our study of this section of Luke, we have discovered that Jesus was subjected to six trials before he was to be crucified. Those began toward the end of chapter 22 and have come through into these verses we've looked at, ending in verse 25 of Luke 23. The first trial was after midnight Friday morning before Annas, the former high priest, when he, was, when he was arrested in the garden and brought before Annas. The second trial was before Caiaphas, the high priest, and members of the Sanhedrin, in an illegal overnight trial. The third was an early morning trial at 5 a.m. before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. To make things legal, you had to meet in the daylight. That's three religious trials by the Jews. Beginning in chapter 23, the civil trials began before Pilate. The Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy, claiming to be the Son of God, claiming to be equal with God. That charge would not hold up in a Roman court. Somewhere between that Sanhedrin meeting and going to Pilate, they changed the charges to a political charge. Jesus is an insurrectionist. Jesus is anti-taxes. Jesus claims to be a king. And they go before Pilate, the Roman governor, because he, only the Romans, could inflict the death penalty on someone. So you have a trial with Pilate. Pilate finds out Jesus is a Galilean. He sends him to Herod. Herod sends him back, and that's where we are in our study in Luke 23, the third, the end of the third and final trial before the Romans. At the conclusion of this, Jesus will walk to Golgotha, 
the place of skull, Calvary. The bottom line is that Pilate and Herod find Jesus not guilty. No charges, no guilt in this man. That is emphasized by Luke so clearly. It's said several times throughout these, this short passage that Jesus was an innocent man. He knows, he knows that the Jews are envious of Jesus. He knows that they are bringing false witnesses to make charges against Christ. He knows that they already had a predetermined verdict before they even tried him. They just wanted to find some charges that would stick so they could put him to death. This is the trial of Jesus. You see in verse 14 and 6 through 16, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion, and behold, having examined him before you, I find no guilt in this man against those charges you make. He's no political threat. Herod, verse 15, he sent him back to us. He couldn't find anything either. I will just punish him and release him. Pilate is somewhat afraid of these religious leaders. They're uh, very threatening to him in the fact that they know that he's already messed up a few times in his keeping the Pax Romana, keeping the Roman peace in Judea. He's already messed up a few times and created situations where, Romans, where Caesar and the Roman Senate has told him, we don't want any riots down there, keep the peace. He knows that a delegation of Jews would go to, to Rome in a heartbeat and accuse Pilate of mishandling his authority in their region. He cannot afford another incident. He wants to keep his job. That's the bottom line. He doesn't want to lose his position. That's the bottom line to this whole scene. I don't believe this man is guilty of anything. I have a sense of Roman justice about me. But on the other hand, I want to hold on to my job. And that's the tragedy of this whole court, this whole scene in this Roman court. He comes up with one plan. We talked about this last time in verse 17. He was obliged to release to them the feast one prisoner. That does not appear in the original in the book of Luke. However, that is a true statement. It does appear in the other gospel records. It was a custom to release another prisoner at the time of a Passover or another religious feast to maintain Pax Romana, Roman peace. I'll let a prisoner go at this particular time of year. Surely he thinks they will want them they will want Jesus released. But they cried out, verse 18, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Here you have an insurrectionist and a robber. That's the very same thing they're accusing Jesus of, by the way. Not so much being a robber as much as being an insurrectionist. They don't really care about insurrection, you get it? Their concern is an insurrection. Their concern is getting rid of Jesus. And they want Barabbas, not Jesus. You see the hypocrisy. Barabbas means, I told you last time, son of a father. Jesus is the son of the father. Which son of the father do you want? And they say, Barabbas the son of a human father versus the son of God. So this isn't about the guilt of Jesus. They hate Jesus. The religious leaders hate Jesus. They want Jesus to die on a Roman cross. They want Jesus to be scourged. They want Jesus to hang in shame before the people. They want Jesus to go through the horrors of a crucifixion where you basically suffocate to death as you as, you're, as you hang there and can't get a breath 
and you end up suffocating. Some people would hang on those crosses for days. That won't happen in this case because it's before a Sabbath. But in a lot of times, they would just leave their prisoners on the crosses for days as a warning to the population, don't become an insurrectionist. It was a horrible way to die. A horrible, horrible way. And they want that for Jesus. Verse 20, Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, crucify, crucify him. And he said a third time, why, what evil has this man done? I found no guilt, demanding death. It's 6 a.m., in the morning, on Friday morning, somewhere around 6 a.m., maybe a little later. And they want to quickly get him on the cross before the Sabbath. And that's their timetable. But God's got a timetable too. Because God wants him on the cross too. You understand? God wants him on the cross too. God wants him on the cross on this day because he is going to be the Passover lamb. He is going to be the lamb that a thousand years of celebrating the Passover is pictured in. He is going to be the reality of that picture that they have been performing and and celebrating for a thousand years or more. He's going to be the one that takes away sin. He is going to be the one whose blood will be shed for sinners so that the wrath of God can pass over sinners. So God's got a timetable here too. They're trying to rush, yeah, but God's got a timetable too. And so Pilate, Pilate's proposal is useless. Notice in verse 23, they were still insistent. That word insistent is like the rush of a storm prevail, excuse me, not, not insistent, the next word, prevail, their voices began to prevail. It's like the rush of a storm. Like a storm was coming on Pilate as their voices got louder that he'd be crucified. Choose between your own career, Pilate, or choose Jesus. You can't have both here. He can't protect both. Peter, uh, excuse me, Pilate cannot survive a riot either. There can't be a riot. He's really concerned about a riot. Turn with me to Matthew 27. We'll come back to Luke shortly, but go to Matthew 27. This sort of interjects a scene that comes in between here that Luke does not record, but Matthew does record. The same trial in Matthew 27, verses 23 through 26. In verse 23, after they say, crucify him, what evil, Matthew 27, 23, why, what evil has he done? They kept shouting all the more, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. What a a chilling statement for them to make. Pilate knew in Deuteronomy 21, 1 through 9, that the Jews had this practice, if you did not agree with the verdict or if you wanted to say this verdict is not my verdict, then you would wash your hands of the situation. And that's what Pilate is doing. I am not responsible for this man's death. I do not agree with this verdict. And the Jews say, his blood shall be on us and on our children. That's an incredible statement. And if you look at the history of the Jews, I would say their history has seen the results of that apostasy of turning against the Son of God. As a nation, not as individuals, many Jews come to Christ, but as a nation. 
While we're there, go to Acts 5 on that subject. Go to Acts 5, verse 27. Acts 5, verse 27. Bringing the apostles in because they'd been preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. They brought him before the Sanhedrin council. This is the same Sanhedrin that had been trying Jesus a few months earlier in these trials. This is later in the book of Acts now. The apostles are preaching the gospel. And they had brought them, when they had brought them, they stood before the council. The apostles stood before the council. The high priest questioned him. I tell you I'm in verse 27. Did I tell you that? Verse 27, the high priest questioned them saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Did they forget? Did they forget that they said his blood be on us? And here they are a few months later. Don't you try to pin that one on us. Now, I ask you to go back to Luke 23 very briefly because it picks up in verse 24. And I just, then I'm going to have you go to Acts, so just get ready. But in 24, I'm just showing you the flow here, how the gospels sort of come together. Pick up with verse 24 and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. Pilate cannot find a way out. He's tried alternatives. He's tried being assertive with his authority. He's very committed to his own self-preservation. He he releases, he's going to release Barabbas. And he knows they don't care about insurrection to Rome. That's just a political accusation to get the trial held in Pilate's court. It's the least of their concerns is insurrection to Rome. There's something that's spoken about that happens now prior to going to the cross that Luke does not record. It's the scourging of Christ and the mock coronation of Christ. I want you to see that scene before we march to Calvary. Go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. A lot of turning this morning, I understand that, but I want you to see these things all, they come together because prior to the actual crucifixion, the common practice was to scourge the prisoner. And Luke does not record that. But John 19 gives us a pretty full account of that, actually. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. This is more than just some kind of punishment. This is more than just some kind of whipping. A scourging is something, like I said earlier, precedes normally a crucifixion where the victim is stripped and stretched. His arms would be tied high above his head, maybe to some kind of pole in the middle of a room. His back stretched wide open. And then a wooden-handled leather whip would be taken. At the end of all of the strands of this whip would be pieces of metal and bone. And the lashes would be applied to the back of the prisoner, tearing the flesh of the prisoner, cutting deep into the flesh and the body of the prisoner, affecting internal organs even. Many people passed out. Many people went raving mad. In this process, many people died before they even got to a crucifixion because of a scourging. This is not just any normal punishment. This is a serious beating. And you would be bloodied. And this was happening not in the open scene. This was take, he was taken back into the praetorium. He was taken back into Fort Antonius for this to happen. And the Roman soldiers would do this to the prisoner prior to the crucifixion. And that's what's happening here to Christ. 
Verse 2, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. This is the mock coronation. This is, you claim to be a king, then we'll give you a crown. They put a purple robe on him. They make sport of him. He's bloodied by this point. And they put a robe over this bloodied body. You want to be a king? Here's, we'll make you look like Caesar. We'll just weave this crown of thorns and like Caesar would wear a wreath on his head. And they slammed it into his skull. That would be a painful thing to happen as well. One writer suggested that the thorns, if you go back to the book of Genesis, the thorns are symbolic of the, of the curse, right? The ground was cursed and thorns and thistles and all of those things and you, all those other things that grow beside your flowers, you understand that? Part of the curse. And a reminder that Jesus became a curse for us. I'm not saying that's intended here, but I just think that is an interesting parallel. He goes through scorn and derision, abuse and cruelty before these soldiers. Verse 3, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail the king of the Jews. They gave him a reed, uh, Mark says, to use as like a scepter representing authority, and then they began to beat him with that reed in the face exactly what isaiah 53 said you will not even recognize him as a man he will be led like a sheep to the slaughter he will be beaten beyond recognition that is what's going on here to jesus then pilate remember the jews are not back here the jews the jews are that we're told earlier, did not want to defile themselves by coming into the Praetorium, by coming into Fort Antonius area, coming into the headquarters of Pilate. They wanted to stay back. So they're not in there seeing this scene. They don't want to defile themselves before the Passover meal. They've defiled themselves in so many other ways, but they want to all of a sudden be legal in that sense. And true to ritual in that sense, and be, they don't want to be ritually defiled, but yet they would certainly lie about Jesus. So they're outside, and Pilate says in verse 4, came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. I don't know how many times you have to say that. And Jesus, verse 5, then came out wearing the crown of thorns of the purple robe, and Pilate said to him, Behold the man. So when, verse 6, so when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Do it yourselves. He is not guilty. Truth, truth be known, truth be known that Jesus must die. The only way to satisfy the wrath of God is for Jesus to die. So theologically, in the mind of God, this must happen. The death of Christ must happen. It must happen this way. And what's interesting is in the Old Testament sacrificial system, the priests were required to first examine the lamb before you took it to be slaughtered. They would examine it to make sure it was without defect. They would examine it to make sure that it was a, a perfect conditioned lamb worthy of a sacrifice. In this scene here, the one who is examining Christ and declaring him an innocent lamb is Pilate. He's examined him. He says over and over again, I find no guilt in him. He is, in God's eyes, a worthy lamb. He is innocent. He is suitable. Because it had to be a perfect lamb. Jesus was without sin. 
to die for you and me in our place, he had to be, God became a man, and he had to be without sin. Verse 7, listen to this. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. I thought this was a political issue. All of a sudden we get a religious issue thrown at us to Pilate. This shows you anti-tax, claiming to be a king, threat to Caesar, insurrectionist. We have a law, blasphemy, to claim to be God. And by that law, he ought to die because he's breaking that law. Now you see their true agenda. It's not political, it's religious. He claimed to be the son of God. It would be blasphemy if it weren't true. It would be a scandal if it weren't true, but it's true. It's true. He is God. And it's interesting. When Jesus would say, I'm the son of God, he meant it in two ways. The first way, it was in a messianic sense, Daniel 7, one like the son of man, Psalm 2, you are my son. I, Psalm 89, you will cry out to me, my firstborn. In Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. All messianic psalms that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the son of God. He used it in that sense, but he also used it in another sense, and this is the one that really got them, was he made himself equal with God. Remember in John chapter 5 when they got mad at him for working on the Sabbath? And he says this in John 5, 17 through 19, If God works on the Sabbath, so can I, because I am God. He called himself God. He called himself God in the fact that he was the same essence of God. If you say you're the son of man, you're the same essence of man. Son of God, you're the same essence of God. He said in John 8, 56, I am. They said, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. They said, do you know Abraham? He says, before Abraham, I am. Bad grammar, great theology. Right? I am. I existed before Abraham. You see? Son of God, this Son of God talk, more than just Messiah stuff, it's equal with God. They picked up stones to throw at him. Jesus said in John 10, 30, I am the Father of one. He made a blind man see, and, and he says, are you going to stone me because I did a good work? And he says, we're not going to stone you for doing a good work. We're going to stone you for claiming to be and making yourself out to be God. The Jews understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. And that is the real issue. And that is their true concern. Roman politics was not or never was their concern. Pilate's questions and Pilate's resistance just brings this out. Verse 8 of John chapter 19. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Now get this. He was even more afraid. He starts to panic. He starts to panic because son of God talk in the Roman world was not a big deal because they had so many gods. A lot of people could be a son of, God, of a god. And it's very possible that Pilate has heard about Jesus' miraculous powers and the things he has done. And, and besides that, I told you last week in Matthew 27, his wife had a really bad dream about Jesus. Have nothing to do with this righteous man. And so that's why you read in verse 8, he was very afraid. He was more afraid. 
Not only is he afraid of the Jews, but he's afraid of Jesus. This man, son of God, maybe the gods are speaking here today. So the claim to be the son of God was very a real possibility in the polytheistic system of the Romans. And verse 9 says, And so he entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, and get this question, Where are you from? Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus is resigned to the charges. He's like a a lamb being led to the slaughter. He has resigned himself in obedience and submission to the Father to go to the cross. There's no defending anything. The question, though, if Jesus had answered the question the way he answered it in John 13, 13, he would have said, I descended from heaven. In John 6, 51, he would have said, I'm living bread that came down from above. He would have said, I am not of this world. But he didn't answer. So Pilate said to him, verse 10, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and have authority to crucify you? And that's true. As governor, he had authority, but he was very afraid of that fact. But theologically, he is wrong, and Jesus answers him in verse 11 and says, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. He says, you don't have authority unless it's been given to you from above. You don't have ultimate authority over me. What's happening is planned before the foundation of the world. This was in the mind of God before you ever existed, Pilate, on this earth. Referring, I believe, in the second half of verse 11, referring to the Jews because of their Old Testament background, because of the light they already had regarding the coming of the Messiah, I believe he's referring to them. Their sin is greater. Their sin is greater. They had the information. They rejected the truth. They rejected the claims with all the evidence in front of them. Therefore, their sin is greater. And that's how it is, folks. The more light you have, the more responsibility you have. You're listening to a sermon this morning. That's light. You're responsible for what you hear. He says in that verse 11, no one has authority over me except the Father. The Father loves me because, John 10, the Father loves me because I lay down my life to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. Acts 4.28 to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. That's the apostles praying to God. Whatever your hand and your purposes predestined to occur. That is God. That is God. That is the God that Ben prayed to earlier in this service. That is the God we sang to at the beginning of this service. That is the God that we worship, all-knowing, all-powerful, never taken by surprise on anything. The story of Joseph, you remember the story of Joseph. The same applies here in the sovereignty of God. The chief priest meant it for evil, but it accomplishes God's good. You meant it for evil, but God used it for his good. Verse 12 of John 19, back to John 19. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you release this man, now get this, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. This man makes himself out to be a king. He's opposing Caesar. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar's. D.A. Carson makes a good point. He says, in order to execute Jesus, they make themselves more loyal to Caesar than Pilate is. And that's all he would have to do, let him go. And there they write, they take their little delegation and run up to Rome and say, do you know what Pilate did this time? 
he let a man who claimed to be a king, a man who claimed to be a threat to Caesar, he let that man live. And Pilate knows this, and Pilate can't afford another incident like that, and Pilate doesn't want to lose his job, and Pilate's afraid of Jesus, he's afraid of these chief priests. Verse 13, therefore when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on his judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Verse 14, now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, about the sixth hour. Roman time, that would be about the 6 a.m. time I was told telling you about earlier. The Mark says Jesus will be on the cross by 9 a.m., the third hour. It's according to what clock you're going by. Some people say, don't throw that in here. Just let it be somewhere around between 9 and noon. I don't know. But, and he said to the Jews in the verse 14, behold your king. So day of preparation just means it's a day before Sabbath. Um, and bodies would not stay on crosses over the Sabbath. And the Roman trial is complete. And he presents Jesus to the leaders of the nation. Here is your king. And he came to his own, and his own received him not. Verse 15, so they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Oh, wow. <laughs> we have no king but Caesar. And that's a true statement. He is their king, whether they ever liked it or not. But that's not a king that can save them. Go back to Luke 23, just for a short second. And this is where this fits, verse 25 of Luke 23. And verse 25 of Luke 23 says, And he released the man after the scourging, after the mocking, after all the things you just read in John 19. We come to this verse in 25. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. That's Barabbas. And he delivered Jesus to their will. Their will. The short walk to Golgotha begins. It's not very far, really, not very far at all to the place of the skull for the crucifixion. This is apostasy on the part of the nation Israel by the chief priests and the leaders of Israel. It's not the end of the story for them, however, in one sense. Turn with me to Acts 3, and I'll close with this this morning. I was going to try to do a few more here, but I'll just close with this. In Acts chapter 3, verse 11, A man has been healed in the temple in Acts chapter 3 by the apostles and Peter specifically. He's healed this man in the temple area. Verse 11, while the man was still clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon full of amazement. But, Peter, when he, but when Peter saw this, replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if, as if by our own power or, or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate. When he had decided to release him, Pilate wanted to release this Jesus. It's his power you've seen on display today. You wanted him dead. Pilate wanted him released. 
But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And this, folks, this is solid, complete grace to this crowd right here. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. Do you catch that? But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, and this is incredible grace, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It does not matter. What sin you have committed, my friends, even if it's the sin of putting the Son of God on the cross, which, by the way, you all had a part in, because your sin put him there, and my sin put him there. It does not matter what sin you have committed. It's not outside the grace of God. Even for these religious leaders, even for these people who wanted Barabbas instead of Jesus, one the son of a father rather than the son of God, the father. Repent, return, and your sins will be wiped away. There is no sin. He will not forgive. <laughs> there is forgiveness for rejecting Christ like those people did. This is some time later, after the Ascension of Christ, that these scenes, this scene has taken place, and Peter is speaking in the city of Jerusalem. So, against all the backdrop of that darkness, there's still grace extended. These men are putting, these men are sinning, these men sin against the Holy One of God and put him on a cross, lied about him. False charges, all this evil they did. And by putting him on the cross, they, they were accomplishing the very means by which they could be forgiven. <laughs> My sin put him there. Your sin put him there. I'm, this is a horrible scene to read about. But you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad it pleased the Lord to crush him for me and for you. Jesus became the curse so I would not have to. Jesus took the wrath of God so I would not have to. Our problem is we're sinners, all of us. We may not go this far. We're all capable of going this far. But it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't no matter how ugly your sin is. It's not beyond the grace of God. The cross meant something to God. The, God, the cross satisfied the wrath of God. In the mind of God, it was not just any Roman or any poor person being crucified on a cross. Thousands of people died on crosses, but only one person died on a cross and took the punishment for my sin and your sin, who died in my place, who was my substitute and your substitute, that I could have forgiveness for my sin. There's no sin too great. You're sitting here this morning, I don't know, you probably think, how could God ever love me? How could God ever accept me? How could God ever take me? I'll tell you what, just look at the cross. That's how much God hates the sin you commit and I commit, but also expresses his love for you, that he would do that for you so that you could go free. We sang about grace earlier. I'm always amazed when we sing about grace because grace is so amazing. I can't understand it. How God would love a sinner like me, a sinner like you. We are here because of God's grace. We were ignorant, Paul says. Gentiles, he says, were ignorant. 
They didn't have the Bible, the scriptures. They were ignorant. They did things in ignorance. They just didn't know. But by grace, he opened our eyes and brought us to salvation. God did his gracious work in our lives and saved us. He called us out to be his church, his redeemed ones. That's grace. We're all just a bunch of forgiven sinners in this room by his grace. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. We praise you and we praise you, God. We praise you for forgiving us. We praise you for going to the cross in our place and dying for us. We thank you, God, for every blow you took that we deserve. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.